I'm kind of humbled here today because I'm in the presence of innovation. And I'm, I'm really just a kind of a plodding high street guy. Um, I manage places. That's what I do. Um, years ago, I realized the importance of place and various things happening in it when I was in Glasgow at the European City of Culture year 1990, which really dates me. Um, right after that, I left to go and live in Alaska, which uh, might sound completely irrelevant. But uh, if you look at the uh, thermometer there, you'll see why. Um, it also says I'm quite a cool guy, really, I suppose. Minus 53 Fahrenheit, frigging cold. Um, in that time over there, I got into place management and what they call downtown revitalization. And I came to realize the importance of um, d detailed micromanagement of a place to enhance the experience. I came back here in 2006, and a couple of years I got poached to um, run um, a place called Reading, which some of you may know is a fairly techy place in the Thames Valley. And while I was there, I started to, it started to dawn on me that the small businesses that I was mentoring as part of my job uh, in running a, a, a busy city center were the wrong side of a digital divide. And uh, that's where my journey down this digital high street started. So, here we go. Um, we're about to kick off this year some really necessary work. I'm not going to call it interesting work because there's nothing radically new about what we're doing. But it's interesting. And it's interesting, I th I'm hoped, I'll explain it to, to, the, to the audience here today. It's interesting because it needs to be done. If it doesn't get done, your job's going to be a lot harder. Over the last couple of years, we've been working on, there's a report to the left called Digital High Street 2020, which was um, government, the high street minister said, we really need to look at this high street stuff and the digital aspect of it. And so he pulled together a, um, a group of leading high street stakeholders from the retail and tech sector, chaired by John Walden, who was just on the phone with, uh, of, uh, used to be Home Retail Group, now Argos, um, quite possibly soon to be called Sainsbury's. Um, what he did was gather all sorts of people like um, Telefonica, IBM, Google, and Lloyd's Banking Group, Post Office, and John Lewis, and M&S, and so on, together, and um, start looking at what a digital high street meant to them and to the small businesses that were surround the large businesses in every location. Out of it came a report, four key recommendations, looked at infrastructure, and you know, anybody who lives rurally will know how bad infrastructure is in this country. Um, we, we looked at skills, and a massive great skills gap. We looked at the need for coordinated guidance to people. Who do you go to if you don't know who to trust? Everyone's trying to sell you something. Who do you talk to who isn't? So we tried to tackle that. And we thought about measuring things. What does success look like? How do you know if you're doing it right? So that report put four recommendations forward. The middle report there um, is a report that was commissioned by um, Innovate UK, which was essentially a, OK, you've come up with this idea for the high street. Now, one of those ideas is to go and form um, a high street digital hub to provide that trusted guidance. But what's your evidence of need for this? Why don't you go out and ask a few people? So we did, all over the country. My little camper van and I trolled all over the place and we interviewed and focus sessioned and it was wonderful. And um, we came back and wrote a report and there it is and it's about to be published next week. And the report, by the way, seriously endorses the need for this coordinated um, guidance for towns and cities. And on the right-hand side is essentially the start of what we're doing here in 2016, which is taking a proof-of-concept approach to this hub. And we're going to do something down in Gloucestershire, and Ch well, Gloucester and Cheltenham, uh, to do that now. Um, let's just talk about <laughs> the immensity of the problem here and why I think this is a problem for you guys. The digital divide is 
palpable. It exists. It's like a chasm. And an awful lot of what you might perhaps think of as your potential target market are the wrong side of it. Or people who would be end users of things that you're developing. They're just not very digitally mature. The gap's getting bigger. And the investment that's being made by the big people hasn't trickled down to the smaller people. So the marketplace that you might be looking into, this sort of high street city town center thing where they're using all these applications, potentially, you know, these smart cities where transactions and interactions and experiences take place. Um, some of them are, if you look at them through a mobile phone and you try to see what they look like through that sort of perspective, through a smartphone, they look like digital deserts. And what you really want to be working within is a digital oasis. So that's quite a directional microphone here, isn't it? Consumers have, by and large, a greater ability just by, you know, just looking around at all the phones and tablets sitting on the tables here. I'd say phablets, actually, in many cases. But, you know, we, the consumer, in many cases, are better equipped and more knowledgeable about what's on offer on the high street than the people who are of the high street. Now that's a lamentable situation. Obviously, some parts of the high street very knowledgeable, not all, by a long way. It does make things difficult for you. So those barriers, what's being done about it? Oops, wrong way. What I think you're wanting is a sort of a utopian world where connectivity just happens, you know, wherever you are, it's just ubiquitous. Speed, you know, the need for speed. You want people that absolutely get it and you haven't got to start, you know, using a significant percentage of your day explaining basic things to everybody. And you want there to be a kind of a collegiate, open API approach to where you can actually go, oh, I'm not working in a little vacuum here. I'm actually able to reach out and work with others, pull consortia together. And data, you know, how much, how much, how much of a barrier is closed data to you all? Sure. But that utopia is not here yet. We've got to somehow work within the confines of reality. So, in order to try and move things along, the reality is that the mainstream needs to catch up. So I come back to that phrase, the trusted guidance. If town and city centre managers, if tourism managers, if economic development officers, all these people at the local level who are in positions of procurement authority, had a greater understanding of the art of the possible, of what you're all working on. If they, could, if they could envisage what you do in action, wouldn't that be an easier world to live in? Wouldn't it be a great place? Wouldn't this be a great country as innovators to be in if you had a really receptive marketplace? It's not receptive enough for you and certainly not for me at the moment. So, Here's a basic assumption. Every place, every place that offers a good experience is usually, that experience is there because somebody's managing it, okay? The job I used to do was a business improvement district manager, a bit like a private sector version of a town center manager. And I dealt with everything from chewing gum, heroin addicts, you know, traffic stuff, parking, cleaning, flower baskets, Christmas lights, food festivals, inward investment, business retention, visiting foreign delegations, hosting and touring. I mean, I did the whole gamut of things. Even touring politicians around when they wanted, uh, you know, good camera uh, outputs. And those people are critical. I call them shepherds because in every place, they're the shepherd that has a flock. Now, one or two of you know my little line here, but... <clears throat> Mel Gibson in Lethal Weapon had a wonderful phrase where he said, 
I'm going to make like a seagull and get the flock out of here. Okay, you know what he meant, right? Well, I'm saying, as shepherds, all those shepherds out there across the country in the 1,200 managed, managed locations that there are, what's their job? Get the flock online, right? And you know what I mean by that. And that's really how simple it is. The problem is, there's this confusion. The phone goes, I've got an app. Brilliant, another one, you know? If, you, if you're at the end user end of things, the phone goes constantly with people saying, I've got it, I've cracked it, it's yours. How do I know what you're talking about? You know, I get people trying to sell me stuff down the phone all the time. So, we've got to raise the level of digital maturity. And in doing that, that can't be done from behind a desk. It can't be done by remote. So this high street digital hub, I'll talk a bit more about it, is essentially a program to pull some specialists together, half a dozen. They're going to engage with LEPs. Everybody know what a LEP is? Anybody not know what a LEP is? Local Enterprise Partnership. Basically, um, there's 39 of them. They cover the whole country, and um, there's versions in the devolved Celtic nations. And they have... They are funnels for money, economic development money. And they're also um, in charge of a sort of a network of places and, and partnerships. And through them, we're going to reach out and actually go into the local partnerships and start the whole digital maturity process. Solutions, services, and skills training. The difference is, we're going to do it all simultaneously. If you go to a place and just deliver skills training, wonderful. Skills, perishable. Can't apply them, they're gone within a few months. Whew, out the back door of the memory. If you, if you do skills training at the same time as introducing a solution, suddenly I'm learning something, I'm using something, I'm reinforcing my learning, and suddenly you can start to see the digital maturity ladder start to work. And that's what we're going to do. In 2016, we're going to pilot this down in Gloucester and Cheltenham. And uh, anybody who doesn't know Polly Barnfield, she's sitting right there. She can tell you lots about it because she's going to be involved. In 2017, what we're going to do is learn from what we did in 2016. And make a big case to the Treasury to say, we want three million quid, please, to set up the High Street Digital Hub. There's obviously a lot of corporations that I'm working with at the moment, IBM, Google, and Argos, and Telefonica, and Lloyd's Banking Group. There's the private sector willing to invest here. Because they get it now. They finally get it. As big businesses, they do better when the small businesses around them in their trading locations are also doing better. Finally, they get it. So... All this talk of, you know, the internet killing the high street, that's very yesteryear. All this talk of big business and clone town, you know, that's crap. It's just, you need the, the, the combination of large and small to make it all work. So we're going to prove that this year and we're going to put some stuff into action next year. Now, lots of text here. These slides I'm sure will be available to you if you want to share my so-called wisdom. But... Um, the heading there is what it's all about. I firmly believe that what you guys need to be looking at is ways in which you can collaborate. If you work in a splendid silo, you're probably going to remain there. There's very few applications I know that are going to stand up on their own two feet and work solo in a scalable and replicable manner. They just ain't going to happen. Virtually every innovation and every application I'm aware of is going to plug into something else and work alongside something else as part of a larger proposition. You've got to, you've got to collaborate. This hub process would be, imagine an online portal that didn't endorse any one of what you guys are doing, but actually helped explain all that you're doing. 
So in other words, it's as much a tool for you as it is for the high street user. In fact, you can see it's kind of a connection point between the two. So the problems that you guys face with trying to find those end users, hopefully this hub will go some way to alleviating that route to market challenge that I think you're all probably facing. Digital maturity just has to keep going. And in a big UK-wide scale, if we crack this, we have the potential to sort of retain our laurels as the most, there's a bullshit bingo word coming up now, omni-channel <coughs> nation. And we, our characteristics, our stats, all show that already. But if we, re if we rest on those laurels, guess what? Other things will happen around us. So, where is it moving towards? What's the trajectory? Expecting the high street sector to move beyond simple. I think for your sakes, you're really hoping it does. If everybody in high streets was challenged even to do the basic stuff, you guys haven't got a, you know, I mean, it's a chocolate teacup scenario, isn't it? You just, you haven't got a hope. But if everybody does start to move up that digital maturity scale, if people are, have gone beyond simple, if retailers, you know, SMEs, people with one business, people with one or two or three businesses, if they, you know, and by retail, we're talking, you know, retail, leisure, hospitality, services. If they start to develop more sophisticated use of tools and applications, well, good news for you, good news for their performance, good news for the high street experience, for the consumer or the citizen consumer, because high streets aren't just about buying stuff. You know, they're very experiential places in this day and age. I was chatting with Jack earlier about you know, the experiential aspect of uh, place and how that's become really important. You know, high streets were always just thought of, oh, it's just a bunch of sh you know, schmutter on sale. You, know, you, 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 you turn up and it's all just about buying things. Well, not really. What's changing is that the high street real estate is becoming occupied differently. You used to have to have about 270 locations to call yourself a national company in the UK. Now you can do that with less than 40. In fact, you can do it with none if you're just a pure play online retailer. So it's a di all this space is going begging. What we're seeing is... Um, the rise of the um, social commerce entrepreneur needing to be in the meat space and the high street is probably, well the side street rather than the high street is probably the coolest place to go. Access to the high street without the cost of the high street. We're starting to see this sort of thing happen. We're starting to see a lot more non-profit enterprises, um, play crashes, um, not-for-profit gyms for senior citizens. We're seeing um, pop-up everything. We're seeing multiple use of premises. So the mix in a town or city center is starting to evolve and adapt to be more experiential. And people, the citizen consumer, is ever more demanding about their experience. And they want that experience to be a physical and a virtual one. So they're hungry for that content to flow. So all the channels and all the mechanisms, whether it's online, whether it's stuff to do with proximity systems and networks, it's all working to a much higher set of expectations from the consumer, and it will continue down that road. So expect the high street sector to move beyond simple. I think that's, a, that's good news for you. Don't expect central government to be able to continue funding innovation in the same way as today. Just been through the budget, you know, the Chancellor is doing a difficult thing, which is balancing the books. Like it or hate it, it's happening. The public sector is shrinking. Depending on what happens in 2020, it may carry on shrinking. So where innovators have been used 
to grant-like um, sources of finance and you know that sort of the vestige of the dot-com and the noughties sort of um, greedy venture capitalists throwing money at you because they don't really understand what you do but they think it might make money one day those days are gone it's a different world you've got to prove your value you've got to show the value so you know standing on your own two feet paddling your own canoe however you want to do it very important and guess what not doing that alone is probably an easier way forward collaboration consumers will continue to set the pace with their expectations and there's nothing that's going to change there the more that those devices those smart devices start to offer um, interaction and experience the more consumers are going to embrace them you think how um, from was it 2007 2008 when the iPhone came along it wasn't that long ago was it and just think how much that has rocked our world um, I'm looking at some of the most amazing you know gizmos on, on the tables in front of people now and I'm going they're not really phones you know yeah they can make phone calls but they do so much more and they enable so much more um, that isn't going to change. I think the whole Internet of Things is going to start to become, um, you know, from a, a rather uh, esoteric uh, thing that nobody really can define, I think IoT is going to become, if it hasn't already, exceedingly mainstream. I think connected devices will start to become um, so much like running water, electric light, oxygen you know we're just going to expect them and the places that we go to we're going to expect them to be connected I hate that word but we're going to expect them to be connected and a place that isn't connected it's either it's either got to be some pretty freaking awesome wilderness or it's got to be connected that's kind of our expectation I don't mind going up on Exmoor and cooking chorizo and beans at the weekend and tweeting about it because I'm proud of my ability to unplug at the weekend. But boy, come Monday, you know, when I'm off the moor and working, I need to be connected. And every place that people go, they have that expectation. And it's not just the access technologies, you know, the prox proximity technologies, the, 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 the beacons, the emerging use of beacons, the maturing use of beacons, you know, the geolocation, the, the use of RFID in the supply chain, the use of NFC in wayfinding, and so much more. All of this is going to become so much more mainstreamed. We've all seen Apple Pay um, sort of roll out, and it's starting to embed people. Oh, it's Apple, so they were the first with the iPhone. They're the first with a you know, mainstream mobile wallet. There are other wallets available, of course, but um, they're the ones that are going to take it mainstream. Android Pay and Samsung Pay are not very far behind. It won't be too long before wallets will actually have a point to them other than just paying for things. And we're going to start seeing that sort of integrated interface emerge in our mobile proposition to consumers. And guess what? Those consumers, those citizen consumers with their smart devices and that all integrated interface, where are they? Towns and cities. That's where they interact. It's the same over centuries, it hasn't changed. How we interact has changed. What we interact with has changed. But essentially, towns and cities are pretty critical things. So my suggestion to all of you is, in developing your product, understand who your customer is, truly. You know, and who, who are the influers, influencers on your customers. So, it's my final slide. I think I've touched on working collaboratively enough. But, again, something I learned living in the Arctic for 15 years, you've got to look after yourself as well. You've got to be, you know, responsible for your own actions. This is not a nanny state, much as I thought it was when I landed here in 2006. It's not. And you, you guys prove it because you're getting up and doing it every day. That point about getting to know who your real customer is, 
Do you honestly know who the end user is? Or are you just developing something hoping that someone's going to come along waving a six or seven figure check at you? If you don't know who your customer is, you might have a problem. But do come and talk to me about it. Be agnostic. That's really quite simple, isn't it? I think everybody here is already signed up to that particular religion. Be agnostic. You know, it's not about an Android system or an iOS system or a Windows system or anything else. It's, it's, it's agnostic that we want. We, the consumer, just want it to work. We couldn't really give a monkeys about whose system we're using. Networking, what are we doing here today? You know, it's really valuable. Every meeting I go to, that word keeps coming up as being part of the value of the purpose of gathering here and traveling. By the way, I left, here, I left home at 3 a.m. this morning to get here. So, you know, traveling to get here um, it's because I know the value of networking. I explained about the hub. I'll be around for a part of today. Please do, if you've got questions, come and find me afterwards. And this is just a personal thing. Do, please, stay cool. It's rather nice for having a cool premises like this to work in. A cool location like, you know, Wild Sussex Digital Catapult Center. It's great, it's inspiring. Um, when I was reading Richard Florida's books about the creative class, I envisaged buildings like this, adapted for uses like this. And it's so good to be a part of it. So, that's me. Um, the relevance of that minus 53 Fahrenheit shot is that it's mine. I took it on the back deck of my house in Alaska the day I left, having just got back in from about 80 degrees above Fahrenheit in Hawaii. And the point about it is that it's completely and utterly unique. And this, this comes back to the identity thing, the consumer thing, and that everything that we're doing ultimately boils down to that one-on-one -on -one relationship with a consumer through that little screen. If you screw that up, they're just going to go off, turn off. So I use that symbol and explain the relevance of it. Other than that, I think it's pretty cool, but it's actually very cold. But uh, that thing about trust is everything. Trust and collaboration is probably a couple of watchwords for me. Plenty of chat from me. Thanks very much for listening, and I hope today is going to be fascinating. Cheers.